you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. The Chris Voss Show, the family that loves you but doesn't judge you for almost 15 years. I think October, August 30th, we go to 15 years. So now I have to start updating that. Uh, over 1,500 episodes, two to three new ones a day, five to, what is it, 10 to 15 a week day. What do you want more from me, people? We're doing everything we can. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad to have you, as always. You guys are the wonderful family. And uh, what other family can give you the love that we can? I mean, how much does your mom give you two or three podcasts a day? No, she doesn't. At least, I don't know. Maybe your mom's a podcaster. She does. I shouldn't, I shouldn't probably make assumptions. Anyway, guys, uh, as always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com, for Chess Chris Foss, YouTube.com, for Chess Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, for Chess Chris Foss, and uh, TikTok. Is starting to kill. We've got a great AI program that's cutting all of our content, putting up over there. Uh, check that out as well at Chris Voss One and the Chris Voss Show podcast. We had an amazing young lady on the show, and she's going to be talking to us uh, about technology, some of the stuff that goes on with recruiting in the recruiting market, and uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, some of the different methods she does to help people deal with, uh, you know, uh, humanizing layoffs and uh, dealing with all that stuff. People. Recruitment, you know, I think I think I think most people have been there, and some of her uh, decades of experience working with Y Combinator and Fortune 500 companies. Uh, she joins us today. Uh, Neha, Nick, and uh, Nike. I'm sorry, let me cut this right here. Neha Nike uh, will be on the show with us today. Her, her company is called Recruit Gion. Did I get that right? You got it perfectly. Yes. Thank go. you so much for having me. So excited to be here, and hello to all the listeners. There you go. And she's the CEO and founder of her company. And uh, she's got an amazing uh, pedigree or resume, as they like to say. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of three successful companies, including a successful recruitment agency, sleep consulting company, which is what I need, lots of sleep, and data analytics company. She is an official member of the Forbes Business Council, an invitation-only organization for successful small and mid-sized business owners. Her boutique recruitment company uh, specializes in keeping or helping hyper-growth tech startups build and keep a first-rate team. She implements strategic recruiting and retainment initiatives to reach an average of 92% fill rate. Damn, that's really good. And increase a company's hiring rate by 65% and reduce turnover from 54% percent to 21 percent and she has over a decade of experience working with fortune 500 companies and startups and full-time recruiting and she shares her insights on tech recruiting and business trends on various platforms we're gonna have a great entertaining discussion today welcome to show Niha. how are you i am doing really well thank you for having me here chris how are you thank you for coming i am excellent it's an honor to have you as well give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs please Yes, it's recruitgian.com. So recruit, G Y A N.com. There you go. And uh, do you have any other uh, things you want to plug with some of the other businesses or activities you want to uh, get in there? Yes, you can also follow my uh, pediatric sleep consulting business at the Sleepy Cub, like mm -hmm. cub as in baby bear, dot us. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm just super excited to be here and talk to you about all things. There you go. So <laughs> give us a 30,000 overview of your company and what you do. Yes. So my business has different components. So initially when I started this, um, you know, actually failed med school um, and then was trying to figure out what to do with life and got into recruitment because I applied to a job on Craigslist, believe it or not. And long story short, started working for a um, clinical, you know, a, a medical clinic in Fort Worth, Texas and helping them recruit talent. Um, and that basically led into me working for, you know, some of the RPO companies. Eventually, I was like, I'm going to start my own business, right? And so when I started my own business, the clients that I was just naturally gravitating towards that were coming to me and I was signing were startups. So, you know, kind of started recruiting for tech roles, 
within the startup world, which was awesome because I got to work with the decision makers directly um, and build amazing, you know, processes and systems to attract and retain high caliber talent. Um, and so that's how, you know, that recruiting agency came into play. But now what we do along with not just staffing is, you know, a couple of different things. So we also work with people who are looking to transition um, out of their current jobs or whether they were laid off or let go for whatever reason. We help you you know, with resume reviews, LinkedIn reviews, video resume creation, et cetera, to help you land that next dream job. And then we also work with people who want to start their own recruiting agencies because I've done it now and I've scaled mine and I know how to do it. And so I really want to empower individuals who are interested in doing that. So I help them do it. And then finally, we work with companies who are, you know, unfortunately having to let go of people. Um, And so we have these amazing employee transition plans where they can work with us to help kind of their employees, you know, kind of go through the transition, right? So it makes for a warmer process, even though it's it's a crappy thing when you're going through it. But we really empower employers to say like, okay, I know you have to do this, but you can use us to help you transition your employees out so that we can support your employees um, who are let go with, you know, their job transition, whether it's coaching, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's whatever review that they need, so that when they leave you, they leave with a place of positivity, right? And you you also feel good about supporting them as they leave you. There you go. And on your website, people can reach out to you for free consultation. You've got uh, consulting packages like employee transition packages, Mm -hmm. smart, uh, start smart recruiting solutions and different things we'll get into. Um, You know, people, when they're first fired, you know, we we talked about this a little in the green room. Uh, You know, everyone thinks they're the family of a company. And there's kind of that whole thing that goes. And then one day you get fired and it's kind of a shock to the system. And it's it's hard to make that transition. Tell us how you kind of help people get over that and the some maybe some of the psychology of what that's uh, deals with it's really hard not to kind of get attached to this concept of you know of, of course when you do uh, when you work for a company right and so a lot of times what happens is and this happened to me i was let go um at my you know previous job that i was with it was an oil and gas company and they're really struggling and unfortunately what happened was that when i was let go i took it personally because to me it was like okay, I had spent all this time and energy and building my team, building this, you know, unit that I'm proud of. And I was hitting all my targets and hitting all my metrics and, you know, making a big buck for the company. And then all of a sudden, like what just happened, right? But when I was let go, there was that, you know, oil and gas ebb and flow crisis, right? So basically they they let me go, not because it was anything personal. It was a financial decision. However, as an employee, when you're going through that, it's hard not to take it personally because, you know, when we are working for a company, we get attached and we feel like we're bigger part of something. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but just know that as an employee, if you were let go, unless you were told it was for like a disciplinary reason, or, you know, if you were not meeting your metrics or whatever, um, most of those decisions are not personal, right? Those decisions are actually made because of the company is going through something. So we were talking about this earlier, but a lot of the layoffs were happening because a lot of companies overstaffed during COVID. And so unfortunately, because because of that, um, you know, now companies are like, we don't need these people anymore, right? There's also this inflation going on. There's like potential recession on the way. There's like a banking crisis. And so, of course, a lot of companies are trying to secure their profits and they're trying to secure, you know, just making sure that they're operationally streamlined, right? And I think that's that's the biggest thing. So it's hard not to take it personally, but just know that a lot of the times it's actually not unless you were told specifically that, you know, it was personal. Um, but yeah, so the way I like to overcome it and the advice that I have for you, if you were struggling through that is go back to, you know, your contribution to the company and just know that there's something better waiting for you out there. I know that sounds really cliche, but it really is true. You know, if I wasn't laid off, I wouldn't have my own recruiting agency today. (laughs) I wouldn't be an entrepreneur today if I hadn't been laid off. There's a famous story in my book about getting fired from McDonald's, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> and becoming an entrepreneur at 18. I didn't really, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm just like, yeah, I need some money. And uh, so there you go. And and this is a great time actually right now. I mean, I, I know it's hard for people to sometimes see that if you've been laid off, but uh, this is kind of like 2008-ish where mm-hmm. there's a lot of brilliant tech engineers, tech people, you know, they know their chops, they're in demand, they get paid really well. And, uh, you know, this is a time where those people usually when there's massive layoffs and stuff, 
they come up with the next Twitter or the next Facebook or the next, you know, the next big thing. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of this in AI. We'll probably talk about some of that here later. But uh, this is a great time. And those people are going to, you know, use their talents and their skills, which they can use anywhere um, to uh, build the next big thing. And I, even like uh, uh, the VCs in Silicon Valley, they know this. They're like, hey, it's 2008 again. Let's yeah. uh, let's let's pick up. I'm sure there's a lot of great people that came out of Twitter's Twitter's layoffs that might, might build the next big Twitter. I, I wouldn't yep. be surprised, or the next big X, or whatever the hell it is this week. Or you know, isn't it called the next? Isn't it called B now for bankruptcy? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> people well, watch their videos 10 to 14 years from now. They'll get that joke. <laughs> I know, but they do say like millionaires are born in recession. Like it's just there you go. It's a very common saying, and. Um, you know, a lot of times, even smaller businesses that are, you know, potentially struggling for whatever reason, um, they are able to pivot, right? And so I think, you know, how much can you pivot and your versatility, versatility, I think is the word, um, will really determine how successful you'll be. So if you have a business that's not working for whatever reason right now, you can always pivot. You can always take your baseline foundation and build on top of that and offer that you can roll out and just try and experiment, right? So you don't have to you don't have to feel stuck, right? As an employee who was laid off or as a business owner um, with all the stuff. I like to live in the abundance mindset. I don't like to live in the scarcity mindset. And I think that w- that's what differentiates kind of what comes your way in terms of opportunities. There you go. Um, and and abundance, you know, I mean, people that code, I've got a lot of friends from Silicon Valley and we used to talk a lot about that stuff for the first 10 years of this show. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing how important that is. So, it may, my understanding, to clarify for the audience, you have two lanes that you work with. So you you work with companies, help them transition with what they're doing, and you also help them with recruiting, whether it's laying off or picking up people. And then you also work with individuals who've been laid off and, and kind of help them make that transition and uh, humanize those layoffs. Tell us how humanizing layoffs uh, is one of the things you help to, to benefit people. Yeah, so my employee transition packages, essentially what it does is we work directly with the employers who had to let go of employees, whether it was a reorg, whether it was a budget cut, whether it was, you know, they're shutting down for whatever reason, unfortunately. So what we like to do is, you know, the employers hire us to work with the employees that were unfortunately let go or laid off or whatever that situation is. And basically my team and I go in there and we work with the employees who were let go. We do mindset coaching, we do resume reviews, we do LinkedIn reviews, we do interview coaching, we help them apply for jobs. We help them you know, craft messages to send to people um, so that they can start getting interviews on their calendar. So essentially it's a support package for the employees who are let go. And the reason that it's humanizing, right? Because a lot of times, and we've heard news stories of how like a dad came home from work on a Friday night and got an email Saturday morning that unfortunately his job has been eliminated for whatever reason, right? And so again, um, be- that I feel like is not the right way to do it, right? I know companies that we, unfortunately they have to do it, but I think there's a better way, right? So we offer a solution where if you want to be a company who's known for your humanizing ways of like treating people the right way, then you can work with a company like me and really support your employees. Because what I do believe, Chris, is that the pendulum swings both ways and there's going to be a time and the world's a small place. So there's, there may be a time that the com- the people that you let go, you may want to rehire, whether if it's not for this company, for your other opportunity. And so if you burn those bridges, yeah, right, you just never know. So this is a really good way for employers to feel good about, you know, their employees who are let go and employees to just leave with a positive, you know, kind of feeling in their mind. Like, OK, our company is supporting us as we start this newer journey. Yeah, you bring up a good point. Leaving a company negatively is never the thing to do. And you never know. I mean, I've had, I've heard stories of like executives that are reached out to people, uh, you know, and and referred them and stuff. And leaving on a positive thing, even if you have to put a smile on the face and you weren't happy with how it was, uh, it can make all the difference in the world. Um, you know, I've, I've had to sit hiring for my companies in front, uh, in front of people I've gone through the resumes and, you know, you, you can sense when people are negative about their prior experiences or there was issues there. Um, sometimes, sometimes people tell you right out in the interview, they go, you know, we used to go through a four step process with our companies to interview people yeah, and we'd all share notes and, uh, and sit in with each other sometimes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> people just. 
put the laundry all out there and you're yep. just like uh clearly you you don't get it but uh, making that mental transition is is important so if even if someone's not part of a transition and maybe maybe they're listening to the show and they're just like hey i just got laid off by xyz it doesn't really work with you guys they can still reach out to you and, and get involved with what you're doing okay. i i recommend that you do um we do have a free linkedin and resume tool that what we do oh. it automatically like reviews your linkedin and resume mm -hmm. um it's a complimentary review and then from there you can decide to work with us or not but we actually um kind of grade you from zero to 100 percent, and we tell you where it stands which mm -hmm. is really interesting because i had someone reach out and they were like my resume is amazing and we put them through the tool they didn't grade too well and mm -hmm. then as soon as we corrected their resume like literally within three days they got three interviews and so wow. Yeah, you may think your resume looks good, but I know what people are submitting and I see what applicant tracking systems oh. on my client's end see. And so I can really help you streamline. And sometimes putting stuff that you think matters really doesn't matter. And so, you know, kind of creating that shift from it's like, you know, difference between what you think you need versus what you really need. Um, and there can be a little bit of a little bit of a delta there. So I, I always recommend like if you're not sure and if you've been laid off and you're like, Hey, I'm not, you know, getting kind of the interest that I'm looking for. Like your LinkedIn, your resume matter a lot. And it is your first impression. So please reach out and we can do a complimentary review for you. There you go. And it's a good test, although I did take it and I it said I failed and I do not work well with others. So I should just go start my own company. Yeah. So I mean, at least it was right on the money. Right. But yep. I was kind of I was kind of hurt feels what I didn't take it. I'm just kidding, people. Um, but we all know I do, I do not play well with others. That's why I work for myself. Um, there are people, entrepreneurs, and there are people that do really good working with other people. And I love people, but uh, just not in a close, confined space. So there's that. Yep. Um, so, you know, uh, LinkedIn is really important, too, as well. You've talked about how, you know, making that look good. Uh, how important is that to, to what people are, are looking at? And maybe other social media. I've seen some different programs that employers can use that can actually pull like all your social media it, mm -hmm. it and puts it into format and so you know how important is that to to present a, a good professional image over there maybe take down some i don't know some cat memes or something yes. or you know silliness that you may have over there um and uh just make sure that you have a professional sort of presentation it is very important, right? And I think it, it's going to get more and more important, um, especially as companies focus on DEI initiatives, which is diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. Um, when company fo companies focus on retention rates, right? And um, once you put something out on the internet, it's there forever. That's that's we all know that to be the truth. And so it can be a really, really scary place. And so I am a really big believer in, um, and you know, I think being on LinkedIn, it's not just about what you have on your profile, but are you engaging with people? Like if someone shares an article, are you liking that? Are you commenting that? Cause that increases your LinkedIn algorithm, right? So again, if you're like, Hey, I've applied to all these jobs on LinkedIn and like nothing's happening, you know, I can give you tips and tricks on how to increase your LinkedIn algorithm because oh, if really? LinkedIn sees you be more active, it's like Facebook, it's going to, you know, give you more content and, and it's going to give people, you know, show your profile more because it knows that you're active. So it's all about the algorithms and how you play the algorithms, right? Um, but again, it goes back to quality over quantity, right? So don't go be crazy and like and comment for no reason. You have to be very strategic about it, but you have to also have an intention behind what you're doing, right? And a lot of people don't do that. And so that's really where, you know, people start complaining. Um, the other thing about social media, yes, if you have an Instagram, TikTok, whatever else is out there, like threads, I don't even know. I feel like every day there's something new and I'm like, I'm still catching up to what was happening last week. Um, but just try, if you are looking for a job as a professional, please, 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 like, make sure that your content on there is you know like okay it's pg there's nothing crazy we've had crazy stories about how hiring managers have gotten and stalked someone on facebook and oh, so just wow. seen some weird stuff and they were like absolutely mm -hmm. not right like extreme political viewpoints for example um stuff like that where you can really people can look at that and say okay no you know this is not a good you know culture ad for my business so Again, just be really cautious on what you put out there. And as it relates to LinkedIn specifically, your LinkedIn profile matters because people mm -hmm. see it. And I know a lot of people who don't update it, but you should be updating that every three months. I make it a oh. point to go in there at the end of each quarter and talk about one thing or two things that I have done that like has you know impacted my clients or my organization in any way. Right. And so make sure every quarter you are updating that because that will be that is seen uh, whether you, you want it to be seen or not. 
There you go. Note to self, take my OnlyFans postings <laughs> down from LinkedIn. There's no OnlyFans for Chris Moss, oh. folks. If you Google that, there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> um, take down my, I, I'm not a flat earther. I believe in square earth. Take down yeah. the square earther photos as well. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a very important thing. Uh, I, I loved it for all these years. We built 130,000 group over there before Microsoft really ruined groups. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but video is still there, but it doesn't grow like it used to. And uh, they, they did like a whole year where they locked them down and then the spammers could run through them um, as they, they were doing some re-software thing. You know, the newsletter over there is really popular. How important is like, it seems like everywhere on social media, everything's a brand now. Everyone's a mm -hmm. brand. And, uh, you know, we're a brand, uh, whatever, the Chris Foss, mm -hmm. Chris Foss. But people need to see themselves an individual professional brand. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. And uh, and that's why I'm asking for your input. How important is it to be, to kind of have a history on LinkedIn, even though you're, you know, you're not searching for new jobs, but to be over there building your brand, talking about what you do, your, your thoughts professionally, professional yep. thoughts. Not your only fans. Um, <laughs> yep. uh, uh, keep those on there so that so that you can have a chance for other people to see you, see your resume. There's always recruiters looking all, you know, they're searching. They, they search me and they're like, hey, we, you want to work for companies? I'm like, have you seen me lately? Yeah. Um, and uh, how important is that? And why, why is it important to really think of yourself as a brand and make it so that that makes you uh, easier to be mobile? In transferring yes. jobs. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about, and this is something that I struggled with, is we as a, we get uncomfortable kind of selling ourselves. It's just, you feel awkward almost like, oh, I don't want to talk about myself. Like, it's weird. But you know what? Um, it's unless you have your brand and unless you are comfortable selling your skills, your achievements, you're not going to kind of ascend that career professional business ladder, whatever it is that you want to call it, right? And so it is the part of uncomfortable that unfortunately you have to get used to, to get to the next level. So that being said, you want to always make sure that your LinkedIn profile is set up so that no matter who sees it, they can say, oh, this person, you know, could be a good fit for this role at my company or, you know, this role for the other other people that I know. Just know that the world is a small place. And even if you're not a good fit for the person that's looking at your profile, they may have somebody who is looking for somebody exactly like you. And that may be your dream job. Right. And so I always look at it that that standpoint. So building your personal brand. And I always say, like, if you can do one or two posts on LinkedIn per week, it's really not that much. Right. You can reshare a blog article that someone shared. You can reshare a clip. You can write. You can do a little polling question on, you know, like, hey, I'm working on this thing at work right now. What do you guys typically do in this situation? Just pull people. But it, again, shows that you are active, right? And so you're not just some person like who has a LinkedIn profile that hasn't touched it in a very, very long time. Um, so you have to start building that brand because as when you start interviewing, people are going to come to your LinkedIn. They're going to see what you're up to. They're going to see what blogs you're sharing. They're going to see what you're commenting on. You're seeing, they're going to see what the types of likes that you're doing, right? And so again, that makes a huge difference. People now start seeing you as someone who has opinions, as someone who is a professional, someone who cares about their professional development because they're sharing, you know, noteworthy articles with their network. And so that makes a huge, huge difference. It's going to really skyrocket your visibility and it's going to allow the right opportunities to come to, to you just by doing these, you know, small, I like to call them 1% shifts. There you go. Uh, and you, there's, there's a lot of stuff you talk about on your website. That's really interesting. You have come, Compass leadership method, compass leadership method, uh, mm -hmm. cohesive culture method, first impression system uh, where you help people. Talk to us a little about that because we always talk about with leadership, anyone can be a leader. And we, what we just talked about here is positioning yourself in branding to be a leader that someone can see, hey, if we bring this person on, not only are they a good fit to be an employee, but they're a leader that has management sort of potential. Yep. So I have three pillars that I really abide by, right? And these three pillars were created with my experience working with, you know, over 100 startups um, and established companies. And the first impression systems, I'll start there. It's basically for startups, your branding, their social presence, their, you know, because a lot of times startups struggle to find high, high caliber talent because they're con competing with enterprise level companies enterprise level companies, everybody knows who they are. You know, we can list out about 10 of them because we're using those products every day. But when you're a startup, you're really struggling to, you know, kind of make that name for yourself. So unless you have a solid online presence, a good interview funnel, 
um, you know, people that are actually talking to candidates and humanizing the interview process, you're really going to struggle to attract high caliber talent. The second method is the cohesive culture method, right, which is attracting people to your company that are aligned culturally, right? And so, again, if you're a startup and you are going to recruit people and they come from really big companies and they're not used to kind of multitasking and taking ownership and, you know, they kind of want their job to be white and black, so to speak, right? And they're uncomfortable with the grays, they're not going to be a good fit for your startup because, you know, as a startup, you need people to wear multiple hats. You need people to take those initiatives, right? So are they going to be a good culture ad? to your business. And then the compass leadership is all about transparency and the, the leadership kind of rules for the organization, right? So is the leadership team transparent? Um, are they honest about what's going on? Are they focusing on DEI initiatives? Are they focusing on the employee well-being, not just from, you know, like, you know, professionally, but personally, right? What are some of the benefits that they have? Um, those are the things that is going to, you know, lead to not just attracting high caliber talent, but retaining them, right? Because what you don't want to do as a startup is keep burning cash on hiring. Oh, they left or we have to let them go. And then, oh, let's hire again. Because now, instead of focusing on your objectives and your goals, whether it's building a product or service, raising more funds, selling and being profitable, it's now going to pivot to hiring. So you're going to continuously be in that weird, you know, kind of cycle where you're like hiring, oh, wait, that didn't work out. Oh, I have to hire again. And when you start doing that, then your attention is naturally divided from what you need to be doing. Um, and then everybody starts to feel burnt out, right? Like, I mean, it's miserable when you're at a company and people are, you know, are being let go or, you know, people leave because it's not a good fit then the people who are there have to take up that load because deadlines still have to be met. So it just becomes this crazy catch 22 situation. And that's why I have those three pillars that I really strongly abide by. There you go. And it, you know, that's important. I learned that we learned this the hard way in starting my companies years ago. Uh, hiring is like 90 hiring well and taking the time to hire uh, and doing lots of interviews and, and being very strategic in it and having a game plan makes all the difference. I, I would guess, you know, you know better than I do, but for me, it was 95% of the game in reducing our turnover our problem employees, you know, you hire somebody mm -hmm. and they have some real toxic behavior, um, which usually was me. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Um, we've all seen me. Uh, but, uh, you know, people that would come and steal from the office. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a fun, famous story. I think it's in my book. There's a fun, famous story of, of uh, where I, I'm sitting in my CEO office, which is this, you know, very large office and it had couches. And so it was, it was kind of relaxed about it and employees would wander <laughs> in and sit and talk every now and then. And we had an employee who'd been with us for a few months. He comes in and he goes, hey, man, you know, um, we had like, I think four offices in three different states for that company. And he, he comes in and sits down. And he goes, hey, man, you know where to, you know where to get uh, really cool stuff for your home office? And I'm like, what? Where? What? What is this? And he goes, he goes, hey, man, there's this room in the company that uh that has like staplers and like tape and like uh, this is a true story right staplers tape and just like printer uh, stuff and everything you need there's a there's a supply room you just go in there you get what you want take it home you can set your whole office up at home and i'm sitting there going you know i'm ceo of my company even though it's a c-corp i own 51 percent and i'm sitting there going is this like a can of camera prank that we're going on and I'm like, are you, are you for real? And uh, he goes, he goes, yeah, man, you can just go back there. And I go, so you're stealing from my company? Yeah. Products from my company? And he goes, uh, no, 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 this isn't stealing. He goes, uh, this is a big corporation, you know, it's a, it's just a big thing, you know, you're not stealing from anybody. And I'm like, I own 51% of this damn corporation. And all of our other corporations, I go, you're stealing from me. That's 51% of my money. And my <laughs> yep. agency is to protect this corporation because it's a living entity, according to the you know, tax base. Uh, and uh, you're basically investing money. I can't even believe you walked in here and had this conversation. This is like, this shows what a density. Anyway, he, he literally had the hardest time getting it because he's like, no, it's a, it's a corporation. It's, it's nobody gets hurt here. Um, but, you know, that's an example of a bad hire that's uh, kind of classic. Um, and so it's really important that, that companies take the time to hire. It makes a huge difference. Um, what are some other things you're seeing in the market with AI? And there's a lot of things going on crazy that way. Uh, how is that impacting uh, job seekers and uh, also job hires? Yeah, I think, you know, AI, I think, uh, has unfortunately 
for a lot of people has, well, I mean, okay, let me take you back. A lot of people that I've talked to at the be- very beginning of when this whole chat GPT thing happened, right, um, was like, oh my gosh, AI is here to take our jobs away. Again, leading into that scarcity mindset. But what I always tell people is AI is your chance to up-level your skills, right? Like how do you work together with AI to, you know, have better time management, prioritize your day and really let it do the grunt work, right? That's what it's here for essentially. Um, And so for job seekers, there's so much you can do. You can make video resume using AI. You can, you know, redo your, you know, actual resumes. You can help it, you know, help tell it to help write your LinkedIn profiles. That's like, actually looks really good and feels really good obviously humanize it like don't just copy and paste stuff i'm against that too but you can do that to kind of up level yourself um and then for employers and companies right ai you can use it for recruiting you can use it for streamlining operations um you can actually have ai and this has been around but like have ai tools source for candidates so if you're looking for an engineer for example you can use an ai functionality to say i'm looking for someone with this years of experience at this location you know i want them to have this specific skill set and then it'll pull up profiles based on kind of your qualification requirement right and so again it gets rid of the grunt work but i i do think that um people are still going to be needed i mean it is human resources right it's not ai resources um and so people are still going to be needed and um you know ai is going to be great to get up level and upskill us and eliminate some of the 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 tasks that are monotonous and manual but at the end of the day it's our job as as people to really help help use AI to help assist us instead of letting take over everything. Because I know people who are like, I'm going to let AI do everything. That's not the point, right? It's the point. The point is we have AI so that we can be better humans. And so I think that's kind of how I approach it is now that I'm not doing the gut work, I have more energy. I have more time to go out and do the things that I want to do. And, and, and positioning yourself with, uh, you know, learning AI and getting involved with that, it's probably a good skill set for people to uh, maybe get involved with what's going on with chat GPT. And there's so many other services now and so much, so much of a frontier of AI. I imagine are a lot of, uh, people in the job market that are, you know, they're brilliant at, at doing coding and, and technology stuff. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, I'm calling it technology stuff cause I'm, I'm a layman in the business. <laughs> he knows nothing. Uh, but you know, the people that uh, build these great software that we have, uh, and future AI projects, are you finding a lot of people are starting to turn their, their focus and attention, especially resume wise towards looking for AI jobs and things like that? Um, you know, yes and no. I think there's definitely a subset of people like, you know, when blockchain was like the new and hot thing, we yeah. saw that right where a lot of people are like oh my gosh i want to go into blockchain now like i want to do everything in blockchain because that's what's and i think we have we're gonna have those ebbs and flows when the new technology comes and everybody's like oh what's threads let me go on threads and then you know like what <laughs> that was a cool week yeah for like two days and then you're like what the heck you know like what's going on um but everybody like oh my gosh i remember when it came out side story and i was like what is threads like it took me like a good week to really catch up and i was like I'm not even going to bother. But I think that's what happens, right? When there's something new and exciting and then we all just like kind of try to gravitate because we don't want to have FOMO. We don't want to miss out on what's happening, right? But then of course, there's also other up and coming industries like there's clean tech, right? Within the environmental arena, we have med tech, farm tech, biotech. I mean, there's so many different uh, technological sectors uh, besides AI that people are still interested in. But of course, when something new comes up, you know, Chris, people are going to say, okay, I'm going to try this out and see what happens. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so you su- do see that shift, but I think it's going to normalize. Like there's going to be a little bit of a, you know, like a, whoa, like this is exciting. And then it's going to kind of taper out again. And people are going to go back to their, their regular lives and their regular interests, so to speak. Yeah. Or whatever <laughs> new shiny thing pops up next yes. week. So, whatever is next i think yep. a is going to be here for a while it seems that i don't think it's going to blow up like it or i think it's going to collapse like nfts seem to have done no, um it, it's going to be here for a while and uh we're all just gonna you know eventually be answering this guy at the terminator so we all, yep uh, we've seen the movies <laughs> On, yep. remote, on remote work and flexible hybrid work, what are some of the trends you're seeing? It's been kind of interesting to see the, you know, the development over COVID where everyone's like, nah, go work at home. If you want to move to yeah. Iowa and, and uh, get a farm out there, you can still work for us in San Francisco. You know, all over the country, there's been issues with this. And then now we're kind of at the great clawback stage. Maybe you can mm-hmm. call it the great clawback. Um yeah. What are you seeing with the battles over uh, remote and flexible hybrid work setups? Um, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Is uh, I don't know. I would say that 
you know, companies are definitely making a shift towards back in office or hybrid mm. or remote. And I think it's because a lot of companies have invested in real estate. And they're like, or not real estate, but also like rental spaces and office spaces and all that. Right. And so they're like, okay, like, and I think there's also companies are like, okay, like people work better when they're in office, you know, because they can like separate like the work and and whatever. But then what companies that are going back to, you know, fully in person, they will see some attrition because there's also companies who are going to stay remote because they want to retain their talent. They don't want to let go of their talent. And they have seen that regardless of where their candidates work from, they're getting, deliverables on time they're getting their stuff done you know high quality and so they're gonna say we're gonna stay remote because we don't really need to invest in infrastructure or anything like that and so the companies that are going back you know full-time you know in person they are going to start seeing some of those employees go from there over to the you know companies that are still going to be fully remote or partially remote at least so we will definitely see that trend um i do think more and more companies are going to start going back into office though just because Mm. it's like you know, the team morale, the camaraderie, the culture, all that stuff is a little difficult to build when you are all remote. Yeah, it is. It is. And we've had lots of authors on that have talked about remote work. Uh, It's kind of funny now to look what's what some of the titles of the book. I see someone did remote incorporated or remote work. Um, And I'm like, that book, I don't know, is that going to fare well? Uh, Do you find that some people... Do you find that there's some benefits people are offering maybe between pay and benefit packages uh, where they're still offering remote, uh, but they're they're kind of using it as like a balance system where you're going to get paid more and taken care of more if you come back in the office? Has that change happened yet? You know, I haven't seen that happen, but I do mm. know that, you know, companies who are, um, you know, kind of enforcing back to office, they're paying for parking, they're having like Taco Tuesdays where oh. they get like, taco trucks on campus for Tuesday. Um, I know some of the companies are doing like, you know, dry cleaning pickups and, you know, stuff like that or having deals with local daycare so their kids can be dropped off at the daycare next to the office. I am seeing a trend in that specifically. Um, I don't know that they can, um, you know, justify the difference in compensation because then, you know, we run into the issue of women and Uh, you're being discriminated. Yeah. And then it's like discrimination. And so I haven't seen that specifically, but I know there's like from a non-monetary benefit standpoint, there's definitely more benefits given to people, um, some companies um, who are, you know, coming into person, like we'll pay for your parking, we'll pay for your mileage or, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, But yeah, I have seen that trend. There you go. Uh, I'm going to send you my resume because I want to, any, any company that's uh, hiring for Taco Tuesday, I don't care what it pays. I will, I will show up for Taco Tuesday. I don't, I I don't 80 hour work weeks, sign me up. Taco Tuesday, yep. as long you know, any, I, I would rather have Taco Tuesday than pizza time. Yep. So <laughs> there you go. Yep. I, know. I love how people reel about, uh, we just got pizzas. Hey, you want to raise? Here's some pizzas on LinkedIn. Pizza. So that's good. Uh, now, you, you said you help other uh, people set up their own uh, recruitment agencies. Did I hear that correctly? Correct. There you go. Uh, expand on that. How can people reach out to you and, and what do you do and help them set up? Are you, is it a franchise situation, et cetera, et cetera? No, it's not a franchise. It's basically if, you know, someone comes to me and says, hey, I, I want to be, you know, my own boss, like mm-hmm. the both of us. And they're like, I want to have my own recruiting agency, I have sales and HR recruitment experience. Um, and I want to build a team and I want to build my clients so that I can scale, right, and live the life that I want to live. Um, I have an amazing like coaching slash like dashboard slash tools, contracts, everything that I give you to start your own recruiting business. So basically empowering you to start your own agency um, and you get to work with me directly. Um, and so we help that set, you know, help you set that up, uh, which is, you know, really exciting because I, like I say, like recession is a really good time to build your re- recruiting agency because when things are re- turn around, you are already ready to go, right? Like you're not having to then worry about the infrastructure and like, oh, I need this tool and I need a Calendly account. Like all that's ready to go and you can literally hit the ground and start getting clients. So there I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Yeah. There you go. Maybe I'll start a recruiting agency so I can get you pizza should. truck or so I can get pizza, pizza truck. There's probably pizza Taco truck. Tuesday. I had Taco Tuesday trucks. I just want, that's, that's all I'm after at this point. If you can't tell, I like tacos. Right. Who Please. doesn't like tacos? I think we should create an island for people that don't like tacos. Yes. Uh, I think discrimination is bad, but I think there's a choice we have to make about the quality of human beings that don't like tacos. Is anybody allergic to tacos? Is there a taco allergen? I don't know. Maybe if they're like gluten free, then you can't have the the twitch. Well, you got to have gluten free tacos. Yes, you can give the corn ones, right? Because corn's technically (laughs) gluten free. There you go. 
I need some that are fat free though. Yeah. So there's that, but I don't think they make those. Uh, but maybe AI will make that technology from yeah. us. Um, so uh, what else haven't we talked about that we touch on? Because you do so much. Uh, no, I think that was it. We haven't talked about our favorite ice cream flavors. What? Yeah, we haven't. What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Uh, I mean, I, I used to go to In-N-Out and I have them do the Napoleonic shake or Napoleon. I, I can never say it right. They just they just correct me. Uh, but where they mix strawberry, uh, vanilla and chocolate. Is that, is that my favorite? I don't know. Yeah, I like I like that, but I like ice cream sandwich. Oh, ice cream sandwiches are good. Yeah, those are my favorite. That's I, yeah. I remember I getting think, those as a kid. I still do that. I buy them for my kids and I secretly eat them when they go to bed. <laughs> You know, the the problem is I've eaten way too many of those. I think yeah. most people have seen me and gone, yeah, he probably needs to cut that off. So we, we cut off the ice cream and ice cream sandwiches, plus like kind of a lactose thing. So yep. uh, we try and stay away from that because no one wants to see that nuclear display of fireworks. <laughs> um, so I got nuclear display of fireworks. I think we'll add that to the show. The and Chris Law Show, the nuclear it. display of fireworks. <laughs> the gaseous sex, but whatever. We'll leave that off the show. Um, so uh, it's been wonderful to have you on. This is very insightful. Um, and, 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 and it's going to be very interesting seeing how things go because uh, let, let me ask you this. I have one final question for you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in this environment, in my understanding uh, of the uh, job market, so I'll have you clarify it because I, I don't know much. I just I just uh, see a thing here and now. Um, but my understanding of this uh, market that we're in is a lot of the boomers and some of us Gen X people, because we're, so, we're the coolest generation, of course, um, have left the job market permanently early because of COVID. Like, uh, especially boomers, they just went, COVID? Yeah, we're out of here, man. Bye. Pulling yeah. out of retirement. And one of the issues that it looks like we have because this is you know i've been i had a mortgage company for 20 years i'm used to seeing massive layoffs in the market and m1 m2 policy federal reserve stuff i've been very familiar with all that stuff too familiar for most of my life um i watched you know four hundred thousand dollars in in the portfolio uh, mortgage values disappear overnight uh because you know on greenspan decided he wanted to blow out my money with a half point increase um the uh, it, one of the things we're seeing right now is it seems like the job market has shrunken to a level where even though we're in a recessionary thing and the, the Fed's doing everything, we're in a new kind of reality of recession where the jobs don't fall and there's so few people, it's very competitive. And in fact, some of the things that I've seen from, I believe the New York Times has covered this or WAPO, Washington Post, where um, for about every seven new seven people that are leaving the job market from the boomers and these people are very experienced in trades they're very experienced in what they do that knowledge base is leaving and there's about one person that's replacing every seven that are leaving and mm -hmm. even then that one person is very young very new which is fine but they don't have that wealth of expertise of 40 years of working and so there's a real challenge there and there's probably going to be a fight you know I, we've had doctors on that have talked about there's going to be a very small amount of doctors i think the pilot business uh, for pilots and airlines right now they're they're really struggling because they don't have a lot of pilots coming in the business is that a good accurate barometer are you seeing that in the market where the fight over good employees is going to become even tougher Yep. And that's why we have a talent shortage right now, especially in the tech world, right? Is because, you know, it's it's really interesting to, to see that. I And I always tell people the biggest problem that companies have when they're hiring and not is not, you know, um, who to hire next. It's really like they usually know, but then it's hard to find that person. And so a lot of times they're having to up level their current employees by, you know, having them do certifications or courses so that they can up level their skill set because there is a true talent shortage in the market right now for um, highly skilled individuals. So I will say that trend is unfortunately, but definitely true. There you go. There you go. And I, I don't think it will get better. I mean, because our population isn't growing. Okay. We've seen we're on a bit of a decline. Yep. And uh, so companies need to take note. Uh, uh, employees need to take note. Um, and searching for, you know, is, is it true a lot of the Gen Xers, you know, they're the people who are going to be the next big, or if they're not already, I think they're on the cusp of it or they're here, where yep. they'll be the largest uh, employee yeah. base. And they seem to want things that are a little bit more life purpose oriented, it seems. Yes. They want to have uh, more fulfillment other than just get handed a paycheck every 20 day or every two weeks. I see. I don't work for other yeah. people. Can you tell? Uh, and they want taco trucks, damn it. So, 
exactly. I guess that's what you're saying. Yeah, I would say that a lot of people now are more concerned with like some of the initiatives with the like they want to stand behind a purpose. They don't want to just find a company, right? Like want to like okay, we're going to save the world by cleaning the oceans. We're going to mm -hmm. save the world by going to the moon. Like what are we doing that's going to save the world? And so very much that from that attitude. So yes, we will see that trends and this is why companies are, you know, really open about, you know, their mission, their values and their vision, right? So that they can actually attract people who really care about those things. So um, it's not just about the paycheck anymore. It's more than that, you know, which is a good thing, but sometimes it can also be really hard for employers to find people, right? Especially when they're starting out and they can't really support um, all the benefit expectations that, that they have. Um, but yeah, I think we'll definitely continue to see that trend for sure. There you go. It, it doesn't look like it's going to get better and they're, we're not making more people. So no. we really need people to start breeding really quickly. Like everyone just go out and breed today. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Um, I mean, some of you have the ability to do it. You're married and whatever. So we need we need at least one more kid out of everybody by tomorrow. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we're gonna get to work yep. right now. Um, and then there's talker Tuesdays. Um, but uh yeah, it's it's gonna be really interesting. And we may be dealing with inflationary measures because with a tightening job market, you know, you're gonna have to pay people more. We've it's so interesting and funny how Geez, I, I remember 2019, everyone's like, no, we can't pay $15 an hour. You know, no way. This, the world's going to end if we do. And now when I go out, you know, people are like, hey, it's 1820 and, you know, all sorts of craziness. Yeah. Um, I've seen restaurants that are paying. They're like, hey, we'll give you a $100 gift certificate if you refer people. I'm like, geez, I'm going to stand on the corner and start picking up people for a $100 gift certificate per head. Um, yep. I'm, I'm going to give me a sign. Hey, do you want to work for this restaurant over here? They're going to feed me if I, uh, whatever. <laughs> But uh, what about diversity hiring? That's one final question I'll get in here. What's uh, what are you guys seeing? What's going on with the diversity gaps, hiring, uh, diversity inclusion processes, et cetera, et cetera? I would say there's again a shortage of diversity hiring um, in the tech world, uh, only because I know that during COVID, a lot of women had to take the back seat, yeah. back seat and stay home with the kids. Because what else are you gonna do? Um, and so we saw that we saw a sharp decline in women in the workforce for a little bit right after COVID. I think it's trying to kind of normalize now for sure. Um, but I think in general, you know, we need more people um, that are diverse in, you know, learning about STEM and learning about, you know, engineering and science and technology and math and, you know, all that stuff. And that's really how we're going to see the rise of, you know, diverse hires in the work for, uh, workforce. So there's definitely kind of a scarcity there for sure. Um, but I also know that companies are have initiatives specifically related to diversity hires. So they say, OK, we have, uh, you know, X number of hires that we have to have a diverse pool of candidates. Right. Which I really like when they do that and they set those goals because then you have to meet them. Right. Um, and it also kind of um, allows us recruiters to start the sourcing and recruiting all those positions early because we know that they're diverse hires and they may take longer because we have a limited pool of people to work with. Yeah. Um, so really setting those goals and numbers. I see a lot of companies do that. Um, there's a lot of companies that say they're doing it, but they don't do it. So please, if you're going to say that you're going to do it, do it. Uh, Wait, um, companies are doing PR spin? No way. A hundred percent. I'm just <laughs> um, but um I think most of my clients honestly are really, really good there about you it, go. which I you know, which I love. Um, but I have seen companies pretend like they're in it and then they really don't do anything about it. So track your data, track your metrics, track what you're doing to actually make that a priority in your organization. And unless you're tracking it and you're measuring it and you're doing something about it, you're not really, you know, pro D and I, I always believe that you need to have the data to tell a story about your initiatives. Um, so I'm, I'm really big on that, but yeah, I definitely see there's a lot of companies making that initiative for sure. There you go. I mean, I learned a long time ago being a CEO and where the buck stops here is I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the right answers. I don't have all the innovations. I ran dry that after about three years and I'm just like, I'm out of ideas. Anybody got any ideas around here? Because I got I got nothing. The tank's empty. And yep. and ideas, innovations, uh, changing of companies. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think Kodak, there's a story of uh, someone developing, I think it was a Kodak, they developed digital film, an employee yep. did or a department did, and they're like, hey, we should do this. And they're like, no, no, I never want that. They love developing film <clears throat> and going to, you know, photo mat or whatever. Uh, we know how that turned out. Uh, so, you know, there's there's all sorts of, you never know who's going to have the right idea. I, I believe uh, the, the CEO of Google was born in, I think he was born in, in a dirt hut on, the, on a dirt floor in, in India. 
mm-hmm. and, and look where he is today. There's no there's no corner on the market of great ideas and great people. Uh, Steve Jobs, uh, his father was an immigrant. Uh, you, you never know where brilliant ideas are going to come from, and you need to be open to them. And, and it, it's just so important to, you know, everybody, everybody, I want to I say everybody has value, but I've met a couple people that don't, or at least in my opinion. But most people, everyone has value or, or can have value. Develop, yep. right? I don't know, or if they behave appropriately. Uh, there's some people that don't, but I think we have uh, places we put them called prisons uh, yep. for, the, for the sociopaths. Um, and, and one thing, uh, other thing I'll throw in here I know we've gone long, but it's been such a great discussion. The best discussions are long ones. Oh, um, is, is, do you see, uh, like my gym has a thing now where you can drop off the kids. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually doing this roundabout so I can set this joke up. So there's a there's a there's a self interest here, but they have where you can drop off the kids, which I I I don't do. I just have my three year old spot me on the bar, and so he helps. And I'm like, hey man, it's a hundred pounds. Give me a break. Lift that thing on there and let's go, buddy. Um, and he's just like, daddy, ah, I poop in the diaper. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't have kids, but. Uh, is, do you see more employers? Maybe this seems to be because child care has gone out of control. Oh and, my and gosh! It, and it makes it so employees can't go to work. You mentioned a lot of women have had to go home to take care of the kids. I know some dads have. With you know, people told me their child support or child support <laughs> that too, their child uh, daycare bills, and I'm just like, holy crap! Like, oh. do you do you get Taco Tuesdays for that? So do you see companies maybe inter- trying to internalize that where you can just drop your kid off at work? I would say that the mid to, you know, enterprise level companies definitely have. I know there's a lot of companies here in Houston um, in the oil and gas sector where they have daycares either as part of it or like literally attached to it. And usually it's attached because of like FDA regulations around safety, around equipment, sure. and all that stuff. But very, very close where you like drop off the child, you park your car and then you go to your office. Right. So yeah. um, it's either internal or it's right next to it and adjacent. Um, but then I've also seen, you know, companies like smaller companies make deals with daycares where like, hey, oh, we have go. an employee here. If they work for this company, can you honor like a 20 percent or 25 percent discount? Right. And then they'll somehow start like a referral network. Um, I've seen that a lot. I see that our current daycare offers that, too, for, you know, certain medical workers that go to this local hospital. That's just 20 minutes where they are getting a discount if they drop off their kid at our daycare. Um, and I think that helps a lot because it's also really good for the the daycare's business. Right. They're getting, you know, um, kids like you know re- repeat clients so to speak because one person is going to tell another person is going to tell another person and then there you go you have a carpool um and go. so i have seen that that trend for sure and i know that a lot of people are being very open-minded about like now people having kids and you know just knowing that daycare comes you know once you have kids if they're gonna you know go back to work and stuff like that so i have definitely seen that and a lot of companies also offer like fsa hsa benefits where you can use that for you know paying a nanny or you know, help any type of health uh, saving spending, et cetera. There you go. And and one thing we should probably address in the market is discrimination against dog owners. Yep. Uh, I have two Huskies and those are my children. So I think we need to have more support for employees that have dogs and like yep. there should be, you know, daycare support for kids and there should be like uh, dog support for things. Then at least I can, you know, my dogs sleep under my desk while I'm working. So they, I should be able to bring them in the office to do that as well. I'm sure that a will, lot of companies actually dogs. do that. They have a bring <laughs> bring your pet to work day they have oh, uh, it's like a lot of a lot of companies are trying to do that yeah the only problem is usually wives bring their husbands for bring your pet to work day <laughs> so there's that marriage joke there people that's what that is uh this has been really insightful and very informative thank you for coming on the show we really appreciate it thank you so much for having me chris and thank you to all the listeners there you go we've had a lot of fun give us the dot coms for all your stuff so that people can go find you on the interwebs and get to know you better and reach out to you Yep. So I know Chris is going to plaster this all over the place, but it's recruitgan.com. Neha Naik at recruitgan.com is my email. And then you can find me on LinkedIn as Neha Dixit Naik. So um, reach out to me, connect with me, whatever it is you're looking for. I love to network. I love to talk, obviously. Um, let's do a coffee chat or even a happy hour chat, whatever time zone you're in. Um, but again, it was an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, just super excited to see you know how it goes. There you go. I'm actually going to start a new Zoom business called uh, Virtual Taco Truck. Tuesday. Yep. There you and go. That's, that's what, there you go. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Manas, for tuning in. As always, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives because you want them to be smarter too. And then that way, when you go to Thanksgiving uh, dinner here coming up at the end of the year, you won't have to look at them and be like, 
do you read anything? Yeah. Anyway, guys, uh, we love you and uh, thanks for being part of the Chris Foss Show family. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss. Subscribe to the big LinkedIn newsletter. It grows like a weed over there. Yeah. And it's so important to be over there. Also, go to TikTok, Chris Foss One, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time. And